Well, thank you very much, and thank you very much for DigitalOcean for the invite, and Learning Foundation and CNCF who actually brought me here to speak on Saturday, so very much thank you to them. And so today what I want to talk about is, once you have Kubernetes in place, then what do you need to worry about? What do you need to worry and how do you manage the security, the scaling of your applications, the communication between your different microservices, but how do you manage that in a reliable way that scales as you scale out your Kubernetes deployment? And the reason this is so important is that as you scale and as you start moving more workloads to Kubernetes and to this orchestration platform, without proper checks and without some proper architecture, it can be very quickly become this confusing state of microservices which are all communicating with each other without very clear directions about where the dependencies lie, where the dependencies exist within your application, but more importantly, if something goes wrong, then it's a case of trying to find out which service is actually causing the problem and why. When you've got a thousand microservices all communicating with each other, how do you find out one which is unhappy, that one which is causing the error? And more importantly, if we know and can detect that, how can we get the system to fix that for us? And so we don't have to go in and have a wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning to go fix some production downtime. Instead, Kubernetes and the platforms that we build on top of Kubernetes can solve that for us. And that's what I want to be covering today and explaining how we can make that happen. So as I was kindly introduced, my name is Ben Hall. I'm one of the co-organizers of Istio London, Istio being one of the service meshes that we're going to be talking about today. And we want to meet up very similar to this where we dive into the heart of what Istio is and how that can be used on a daily basis. And I'm also the founder of Catacola. And Catacola, for those who haven't seen it, is an interactive learning platform for software developers, primarily focused on cloud and cloud native technologies such as how do you get started with Docker, how do you run Kubernetes, and then how do you actually start working towards that within production. So covering topics like Docker security, scaling Kubernetes, and service mesh technologies that we're going to see today. And so what do I want to cover, and what's going to be the heart of the topics tonight? So to start with, I'm going to give a context into Istio and service mesh and why this new type of um, organizing and structuring and deploying our applications it's starting to pick up traction, starting to pick up interest. And then we're going to discuss how that can be used in a kind of day-to-day -day operation basis. So how can we use this and service meshes to communicate and connect our microservice applications? And as a result, once we have this managing our communication, how can we use that to increase reliability, reduce the errors that may or may not occur, increase the observability before Observability, things like metrics and tracing, and then finally security, because at the end of the day that is critical in order to make sure that our applications work at scale. And so why is this important, and why do we need to have a service mesh concept? And as I indicated at the start, as we start building more and more services on top of Kubernetes, the complexities involved in having those services run also increase. If we want a service to ensure that if there's any problems, it automatically retries, then that logic needs to be implemented somewhere. That doesn't come out of the box with Kubernetes. And so that now means that we need to implement that within the microservice itself. And so once we have the retry logic, what happens if we want to do security or authentication? OK, now our microservice also needs to include that. And then it continues. Things like retry logic, failover is rate limiting. And suddenly, our nice little microservice, which was very focused and supposed to be open, only solving one particular job, has quickly solved the entire infrastructure layer. And the actual business critical aspect of what it was meant to do is only one part of a much larger system. And now we have these micro monoliths, all solving the same problems, all deployed on top of our, our systems. And this, re this repeatability of the infrastructure related topics is just noise. We want to remove that from our systems, let the infrastructure deal with that layer, and so our microservices can focus on the business value and let the infrastructure do what it's meant to do, which is supporting our applications when they are winning on top of the system. Something which Kubernetes is doing amazingly good at, and we can then use these service meshes to build on top of that and provide even more value. And so this is a quote from um, one of the creators of Service Mesh, in this case, Linkerd, 
And so they then describe that as a dedicated infrastructure layer for making service-to-service -service, service -service communication safe, fast, and reliable. And the quote from the creator is, if you're building a cloud-native application, you need a service mesh. Now, this is all very well and good coming from the creator of a service mesh. They are kind of inclined to say that every application needs it. But I think it's important to understand why they exist, the value they bring, and then you can make a judgment decision about whether that's right for your, the applications which you're um, building at the moment today, or whether that's something which you should look towards and integrate later on, maybe tomorrow, next month, or next year. And so we have Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes providing the foundation of how we're running applications, how we're running containers at scale. It's taking care of how do we do rollouts? And so if we want to update our application, how do we ensure that that's managed in a successful way so that we can do zero downtime deployment and that one image will naturally roll out across our entire cluster? And if there's any problems, then it will stop and it will make sure that our application stays alive. And if something goes down, like we lose a node or we lose a data center, then Kubernetes will manage that. It will ensure that we keep the capacity that we need and make sure that our systems remain working even in event of the large scale system losses. And it's doing an amazingly good job at that. So let's see what Kubernetes is from a very one on one point of view, just to uh, get everyone on the same page about how can you actually use Kubernetes. So in this case, I'm just going to be using Catacoda, and in this case, we have Minikube. Now, Minikube is a great um, tool for those who haven't come across it before of running Kubernetes and having a cluster working locally. And so this will go through, it will deploy all of the required components that you need, and then you can start um, experimenting, testing out different uh, structures, testing out your application on top of Kubernetes, making sure that it's ready before you deploy it onto someone like DigitalOcean. Ah, no look, intended. Um, and so in this case, what we can see is that we're using Catacoda to give us a safe environment so we don't have to download or install anything. And so what this is doing is going through, it's launching the containers, it's downloading the required images. So in this case, it's using kubeadm. Kubeadm is a great way to initialize a Kubernetes cluster, get something running, get something working. It takes care of all of the complexities of Kubernetes when you want to run it locally or within your own data center. And so what will happen is this will bring up all of the components, things like the database, the XED server, which will store the state, the controllers to make sure that thing can be deployed and managed successfully, and all of the communication layers that Kubernetes needs. And so now once this is running, we have our first Kubernetes cluster. We can use kubectl, which is the uh, command line tool for interacting with the Kubernetes cluster. We can ask for its information and it reports back um, where the cluster is currently running, in this case, the IP address, um, and that we also have a DNS service. So we can do DNS-based lookups. For example, if we wanted to find our database, we could do database.server.myproject.kubernetes, for example, and it will resolve to the correct instance. And if we do get nodes, this will tell us all of the nodes within our cluster. Everything what, um, where the workloads will be actually running. Because this is designed for development purposes, we only have a single node, but you would imagine if you pointed this to a cloud provider, then all of your nodes would be listed there. And just using kubectl, we can start running applications. Um, in this case, if you ignore the redundancy, uh, we're going to use kubectl, uh, or kubectl, depending on the flavor. Uh, we'll give it a nice name, in this case, um, deployment, let me just want the colors. Um, and then we give it a name so that we can refer back to it, like this reminds me of deployment, but you can imagine it could be your web front end, your payment service, your database. And then we point it towards a Docker image, like what container do we want running on top of our Kubernetes cluster. And so what this will do is, this will inform the Kubernetes um, master, or kind of the um, API, that we want a new workload running on top of our cluster, and we want this container running, and this will start a pod. A pod is the lowest form of workloads within Kubernetes. For all intents and purposes, it's um, a one-to-one -one relationship with the container with a few added benefits. 
but for now, let's just say it's our container. And now Kubernetes is managing that. And we can manage that container that's winning. And we can look at what's actually winning on the actual Docker instance. And there's lots of stuff because this is the entire Kubernetes offering. But we can see at the top we have our container, um, our Docker, uh, our Catacoda, Docker, HTTP service running, as you would expect. And now Kubernetes is managing that lifecycle. If you want to upgrade it and deploy our new version, then it will roll out and we how Kubernetes. If it crashes and if it dies, then um, Kubernetes will restore that for us. And we can do other things like we can create services and we can expose it. And we can get um, the application response, in this case reporting which part actually managed that request. And so at a very high level, we know about Kubernetes, um, if I back to the slides, we've now got Kubernetes managing our deployments. Like we can give it a container, we can tell it to win that container, and everything's happy. Kubernetes is taking care of that heavy lifting for us. And this is what we need, right? We've got our deployments, which is what we created, our first deployment object. This we did with a command line, but in reality, when you're dealing in production, you'll do it in a YAML file or some other uh, specification, like Helm or KSonic. And this defines our spec. This defi defines our desired configuration about what we want to run. So we have our image, in this case, Nginx. We say that we want three replicas distributed across our cluster. So that if we lose a node, then we're not going to lose all of our capabilities and all of our traffic. And now, within the top of this, we can define labels. This is how Kubernetes knows how to link together different services and how to send traffic to the relevant components. So in this case, we've got an app called Nginx, and then we can use a service, give an external IP address from a load balancer, and say, like, when any traffic comes into this IP address, forward it on to any application that's deployed, which has got the label app Nginx. And that's how we can start to build together these complex systems and ensure that everything can communicate, but also be very independent and uh, lightweight at the same time. When it's winning, we have pods, and so pods can um, live in our right. We can have volume, so we can do persistence if we want to live within pods, or we could use another provider. And pods can contain multiple applications, uh, multiple containers. So we can start to build up much more complex systems um, then it just being a one container related, uh, related aspect. And then obviously Kubernetes wouldn't be complete without some IP tables black magic. And this is where it gets a little bit scary and very rarely you need to get into the IP tables uh, level of concerns, but it's always interesting to see what is actually happening in the covers. Like when traffic comes in to um, one of our nodes, so node one or two, we get it onto the internet zero, this is then forwarded using IP tables, it forwards all the traffic onto um, the bridge, and then that will then tell it which part um, the actual response needs to go to. And then all of IP tables are connected together. And so when we deploy a service, what we're actually doing is we're telling Kubernetes how to configure these IP tables, and how to configure all of the traffic routing that we have in place. And so we're building on areas that already exist. But what happens if we want more control? Like we've already defined how we want our traffic shaded. Like if I want to talk to my database, I've got a DNS server, so I just talk to my database. And that's great, that comes out of the box with Kubernetes and that's what we can do today. But what if we want to be more advanced? What if we want more control than that, than what, um, for our patients? For example, what if we want to do A-B testing or Kubernetes releases, where we only want to deploy our uh, new release to 10% of the traffic? or we only want to deploy it to Android users within the US so that we can test the impact, we can make sure that our changes are working successfully before we roll it out across our entire infrastructure. And with that, the APIs that we have for Kubernetes, that's extremely difficult. We don't have those real <coughs> kind of um, APIs and those explanation points built in. Other things like tracing, and system metrics and all of this capability, we need to add on ourselves. We need to build that within our application. And again, adding in metrics makes our microservice slightly less micro. And this is where service mesh steps in. The service mesh gives us more capabilities and builds on what Kubernetes is offering today. And there's various different options available. 
So we have this failing ship, which is Istio, which is backed by IBM, Google, Lyft, and various other uh, companies who are working together to collaborate around it. HashiCorp has got Console, which you may know from service discovery and uh, kind of like uh, key value pair and um, looking up services. That's been extended with Console Connect, which is their take on what a service mesh looks like. It's straightforward, it's very um, easy to get set up in, the, um, in an environment, but it has got very powerful capabilities, some of which we'll see um, ICO also providing, um, but the console is in a much more concrete way, simple way, straightforward way, I don't know the right word, but it's lightweight um, and it's got some nice capabilities. We've got Aspen Mesh, which is an enterprise offering and a commercial offering on top of Istio, um, back to IF5, and then we've got LinkedIn, which is part of the CNCF, it's part of the foundation. Again, offering service mesh capabilities that we'll see um, from Istio in our demos. And there's other offerings that you may have come across before, which all fit within the service mesh ca categories of how can we make microservices easier to communicate. And so what Istio offers is four key capabilities. We have more control of how we have more capability about how we control our traffic. So being able to perform things like A-B testing or shifting traffic so that we only want 20% of the traffic to go to our new release or a particular part. We can make it more secure out of the box by having mutual TLS so that everything, every service within our system is talking over a mutual TLS enabled connection. What does this mean? Well, everything will be encrypted. So you can't sniff any packets between your networks. Something which is very hard to do, something hard to manage, comes out of the box for free when you use an Istio. But it also ensures that the service that you think you're talking to is the one which you are actually meant to be talking to in the first place. So no one can do a man in the middle attack or replace the service with something else and say and act like they're your trusted payment provider when in reality there's some rogue service that a hacker in place to steal and uh, scrape data off your network. We have the control of uh, how we can get things, and then we can observe our traffic. Instead of our deployment being a black box, we gain visibility. We gain insights into how our traffic is performing, how our system is performing, what's working well, and where problems may exist. Allowing us to identify why uh, things are going wrong and where they're going wrong, and allowing us to fix it more quickly. Um, and with that, let me just jump straight into a demo, and we can see this in reality. So, on Catacoda, you've got all of the content, so when you're back at the office tomorrow, um, you can play and you can explore um, Istio in more depth. But here, I just want to get you started, and I want to help you understand all of the moving parts and some of the things which I've just discussed. Um, if we go to... Server. So um, we wait for our cluster. So we have Kubernetes. You can say get nodes. So in this case, we've graduated. We're not just using a single node Minikube. We have, have a multi node cluster. So we have a master and our node working. Um, and this could be provided by any provider. This could have been done from um, a cloud provider or someone um, deploying Kubernetes on premise. And at the moment, it's just vanilla out of the box. We've not done anything to it. So to deploy Istio, the first step is to download um, the latest binaries and templates. And this um, package contains a set of YAML definitions. So what Kubernetes is doing when we, we deploy it, it's actually taking the APIs that are available in Kubernetes and extending them. It's creating custom resource definitions so that we can have a more um, targeted API which reflect the type of problems which we're going to be solving. Like, how do I do a canary release? It gives you an API to describe that. Like, how do you weight traffic between different components? Or how do you make sure that our system is acting securely? And so these are all of the API extension points that have been uh, put in place. And so that's the first thing that you deploy. And the second is um, this demo call. And now it looks like it's deployed a lot, and to be fair, it is. But this is deploying everything on top of Istio. It's a YAML definition, and these are all of the components that um, Istio will provide. 
And if you look at the new pod start winning, we can see that um, a lot of capabilities and a lot of extensions have been built in. And we'll talk about these in a moment. But you can see some things instantly that are interesting. Things like Grafana. So we have some metrics and dashboarding in place. Things that you may already be familiar with or using internally, um, like Prometheus, collecting metrics from our application, from our systems. So tooling that's already there within the CNCF and the CNCF uh, cloud native family and ecosystem is at the heart of everything that SEO is bringing together. And then within a couple of seconds, we now have all of these required components running, and we now have our system, uh, SEO, running on top of our Kubernetes cluster. And we're going to enable some uh, external endpoints so that we can see our dashboards and make things available. And so what happens when we actually have this in place? So in a normal Kubernetes cluster, like what we deploy, we deployed our container, we deployed our image, and that created a pod, and that is running our workload. Great, we have our workloads running inside of a pod. If we need more capacity, we add more pods, we scale up, everything's great. With Istio, we have a lot more capabilities. So now, alongside of our service in our pod, we have a proxy. It's using an Envoy proxy, and it covers, again, part of CMTF. And it produces very lightweight, low latency traffic. And this allows us to have this control and these capabilities. So everything that we're doing within Istio, a large part of it is configuring how Envoy operates and how Envoy works. And so we're getting this very advanced, very rich proxy service available to us via a Kubernetes API. And then under the covers, um, Istio offers three key components. So we have our control plane API, so this will be Kubernetes or another orchestrator that may exist in the future, like uh, something else which may exist in the future. Um, and then we have the pilot, the mixer, and Citadel. So Citadel is responsible for issuing certificates. So when I said that, everything, all of our communications were doing over encryption and using TLS, you need something to issue those certificates. And this is painful and this is complex. And we don't want to be doing that ourselves. And so Istio has that component in place. And this will also manage rotation, so that if our certificates expire, it will automatically rotate. And these rotate on a very frequent basis so that if someone does manage to break in, they're not going to be able to have a valid certificate in place. We have the pilot, which is used for configuring um, the settings and configuring the proxies um, within each of our pods. And then we have the mixer. And the mixer is bringing it all together, is collecting all of the metrics and the telemetry and understanding how our system is working on top of um, Istio and also making sure that if we have blocked something like you're not allowed to talk to a particular service, like our web front end can't talk directly to our database, then the mixer will be there to ensure that that is being adhered to and that is being um, in place. So what we also have is a demo application that the teams put together, um, the Istio team and community have put together called Book Info. And again, we'll just deploy that. But what you'll notice is that when we deploy our book info application, we're also using this Istio, control, um, Istio control cube inject. And so what we're doing is we're taking our existing YAML definitions that you're using today to deploy Kubernetes, very similar to what I've shown you in the slide, and extending those with the Istio required um, components. And this can be done automatically, but you can also do it on a manual basis. So only the applications that you want to be enabled and want to build on top of the service mesh do, and the rest of your systems can remain in touch. So you can pick and choose um, how much impact you have within your deployment. And so we've deployed this application, and we can now see that we've got our book info app winning. And again, I'm just going to apply some rules, and let me show you the architecture. And so this is a beautiful website. We've got, um, it's called book info, it provides reviews and data on books which you may see from very popular uh, cloud providers. And so we've got um, a microservice architecture, we've got our product page, which is the page that users come into, and the first thing they'll see. That goes off and calls a movie service, which gets, gathers and collects more details. It then has got um, access to reviews, 
Now the team are still currently working on reviews. It's not a finalized version. And so you've got these three different versions in place. You've got V1, which was their first release. All it did was return a review. Like, great, this is an amazing book, or wasn't for me. They've then been quickly working on that, and we've got V2, which returns star ratings, which they go off and they get from a no service, which we have the, the ratings. And then we also have V3, which is where they started to add some beautiful design, in this case, just making the colors, um, the stars in a different color. And so if we go and visit the book info page, that the product page, and hopefully this will load up. So we can see um, we've got our book info, we've got our product page, and that's an aggregation of our book details and our book reviews. And what happens is if we hit uh, refresh, it's just doing it in a random way. So if we, um, we're now, we're talking to our review service, and in this case we're going to V2, because we haven't provided any controls. In this case, V3, and if we go back again, V3, and we'll get different responses each time. And this isn't a great experience from a user's point of view. Like, it's great from a developer's point of view because we can see the application working and we can test to make sure that V3 is behaving how we want, but the user is now getting inconsistent experiences. And with Kubernetes itself, this is difficult to manage and this is difficult to structure. But with this power of Istio and Istio's traffic control, we can start shaping some of this. And so this is one of the examples of what um, Istio is providing and the extension that has been um, added. Um, and so we've got this new uh, Kubernetes object of virtual service. And this allows us to control how the traffic is being routed and how the traffic is being handled within our system. And so in this case, we're applying a new route to the reviews, so that reviews microservice. When a HTTP request comes in, if it's got a HTTP header, which is called ng that equals JSON, then send that traffic to v2. Otherwise, send everyone else to v1. And so now what we can do is we can do deep inspection into every single HTTP traffic, uh, HTTP request coming into our system and use that request to indicate where it should go and how it should be handled. And so if we apply this, just how we apply it, it changes into Kubernetes. What this is going to do is it will change the um, Envoy proxy configuration via the mixer and some other details. And so now when we go to our page, we will only ever see v1 because we're not logged in and we are just a normal user. So from an end user's point of view, I now have a consistent behavior have a consistent experience for my application. But from a developer's point of view, let's say I'm team lead or tester Jason, I can log in and I can see V2. I can see and I can test it in a production environment around everything else within the production system. And so now I can actually see it on a live traffic without affecting any of our normal production user traffic uh, that may be happening. And so now I can do load testing, I can do performance, accessibility, everything I need to do, and then make sure that that system is reliable. And then if we log out, we hit refresh and we go back to our V1 version and our V1 response. And this can go a step further. So as I was saying with things like Canary releases, so we can start using the same virtual service API that's in place in order to control the weighting of our traffic. And so in this case, we're saying for all of the thing, all of the HTTP requests coming into reviews, split the traffic 50-50 between V1 and V3. So we're confident that V3 is working, but we want to do a gradual rollout to make sure that there's not any odd bugs that may have appeared. And now I'm locked out, and so when I'm hitting refresh, I'm getting bounced between two different versions. And again, we could have added more weights, we could have added more inspection, say only apply 50% to Chrome users, or Safari users, example. But we have this API now to define how we want that to work. And then when we're ready and we're happy, we can just say, now update the virtual service for reviews to send all of our traffic to V3. And so now we can change how that routing works, we're confident and we can roll it out all of our traffic across our entire cluster. And so now, when I'm hitting refresh, I'm just getting the V3 um, response. And so this is a great way to do canary releases, 
way we to do testing in production and be confident with your releases uh, before they go live. But in order to be confident with your releases, you also need to know how the system is working. Like just having a great, um, just having a response going, it looks right, doesn't mean that the end of the cover is not falling apart. And so we need to have more visibility into how our system is responding. So what I've done is just started a very simple, quick um, load test, just by curling um, our application. And now we can use these components that we deployed alongside um, our traffic, alongside um, which we deployed with Istio, to start seeing visibility into how our system is behaving. And so you can see in the top corner, we've got this global request volumes, and you can see when I started that load test, because we have this huge spike in traffic. And this is coming from a live system. We haven't had to change our application, we haven't had to modify anything, because Istio is at the heart of everything that our communications, everything at the heart that our microservices are communicating, is just collecting all of this data and producing it in a way that we can dashboard. And then we can drill into services. So if you look at our reviews, for example, we can actually see how that is operating. And um, all of the reviews have been handled by all of our, our the reviews, these three have handled in all of our traffic. And we can see the success rate, so making sure that we're always getting 200. If that dropped off our third scale, scale, you'd see that change and adapt. We can see um, things like the request size, the duration, how long it's taken to be processed. And we have lots of data, so what happens afterwards? Like, where does the traffic go afterwards? Did it go off in all of the services, um, the workloads, and how did they respond um, in a result? So if we look at something like, our product page. Then we can see our product page, see that everything's happy, see that all of the requests, and make sure that all of our workloads are being handled uh, successfully. And now if we stop this unit test, uh, load test, then we'll instantly see this traffic drop off and see it go down to a zero level eventually. And this all comes out of the box, and this is great for providing dashboards. But we can also go deeper. So it's great to see that, yes, our systems are performing, but if there's a problem, then how can we detect that very quickly and very easily? And so if we look at our product page, we can use Jaeger and we can use Open Tracing to view all of the HTTP requests within our application. So this is every request that has come in um, to our system. And then we can actually drill in to these traces. And this is a trace of the application request. And it will tell you every component and every service that interacted in this HTTP request from the user, how long every single component took. And so we can see our architecture. Our architecture slowly starts emerging. We've got our product page. That goes off and calls details. We've then got another product page doing some processing, which is calling reviews. Reviews do some more processing, which involves calling ratings. And if we introduce any delay or any problems, then this would appear directly within the dashboard. If our rating service, for example, starts taking three seconds instead of one millisecond, these traces would be huge. They would expand out, and you'd be able to quickly drill in and identify if ratings that's causing a problem. From the home page, it's also great to be able to identify um, outliers. So at the top, we have our requests. So everything is borderline between 30 and 50 milliseconds. But you can imagine that if a user has come in and they had a bad experience, their request could spike to one or two seconds. That will go to support and go like, hey, your website is really slow. And we all know what happens. Like, it's quick for me, um, it's not our problem. But sometimes it is. We just don't know. But with tracing and these traceabilities and all of the data that Istio is collecting, we now can visit visibly go into the tracing dashboard and look, is there any requests that are taking one to two seconds? And if so, which component in our system actually caused that to happen? What happened, what was the time, which pod actually had that impact or which node? And now we can actually reproduce and identify the issues and improve our system instead of going, it should be fine, it looks okay from here. And all of this is just coming out of box and available. But we can also start using other toolings. So this is one of my favorite 
um, which you may or may not have seen. It's from a company called Weave. And it's a great way that when you're deploying complex systems, you can just deploy this onto a Docker host or onto a Kubernetes cluster. It runs as a web service um, on a port, which we've just deployed and made available. And so now if we go and look at the Weave dashboard, what we will do is look at the live system, look at all of our live traffic and the live communication between all of our components and build up a dependency graph. And so we can see everything that's happening. And so this is quite a annoying view because this is Kubernetes plus Istio plus our application. Now everything's in a namespace, so we can just uh, actually just show me everything within default. And so now it will just show us our application. And we know, because we have that beautiful diagram, what our application generally should look like, and it's looking pretty reflective, all inferred based on what our system is doing. So we've got our product page coming in as the root. This goes off and calls review version 1, 2, and 3, and also details. And review version 2 and 3 also calls the rating service to get the number. But this is all inferred by network traffic and communications. No one's had to go in and build this diagram no one's had to tell Weave how our system is meant to behave. Instead, Weave have actually figured out how the system is actually working with the components and our dependencies actually exist. And this can work without SDL. You can just deploy this on top of Kubernetes and it can still gain this kind of very insightful visibility um, into our application. And so what did we do within these quick demos? Yeah. Can please repeat the name? Uh, so this, what I just showed was Weave Scope. Um, so Weave Works, they're based in London. Um, they do a lot of work. Um, so if you go to their GitHub and go Weave Works slash Scope, um, then it will tell you everything that you need in order to be able to deploy um, and, have them, and build up these charts and drill into the details of the system. And so what do we have? So we went through our traffic shaping, so we could control our application, we can control who saw what version and when they saw it, using a very consistent Kubernetes API. Um, we've got some more examples there. We've got our components that are in place. Um, the three key components that make all of this happen. Um, and I can share the slides and these go into more details. Um, what I wanted to get to is security. Because we looked at how we handle tracing and capabilities. Let's dive a little bit more into security before we finish. And so what we have is, this is how the TLS is working under the covers. So we have Citadel, which is our cluster uh, CA. And so the CA is responsi responsible for the authorizing and issuing all of the certificates. And so as you can see, it's got the generation, it's got the deployment, any rotation, so making sure that they're always fresh and no one can um, grab them and neutralize them in a naughty way. And with auction, so if we do get exploited, if something does happen, we can say that that certificate is no longer valid because of a malicious actor, which may or may not happen, but let's be safe and um, make sure that all of the certificates are updated and fresh. And again, we're using that power of Envoy sitting there alongside our application and building upon the service in order to provide a TLS. So making sure that our service in pod A is actually the correct service, communicating in a very secure way without our applications needing to change. Our applications are exactly the same. We haven't had to modify them. They don't have to understand Envoy. They don't have to understand TLS. But because we're building on these foundations, they get secure naming, they get all of the encryption for free. And then we can say we have a much more secure, reliable system, as we thought. And we can block things like our, a SQL injection or a hacker exploiting the website, then accidentally being able to access an entire database. Because we can build up these walls and these firewalls which are in place. But it's not just the internal traffic that we have within our system. Istio and Envoy can also manage outbound traffic. And so we have this egress gateway, which manages all of the outbound communications. And this is optional, but I think it's critical when you're deploying a secure system. Like if we follow good container practices, of we build our container image using GitLab or some CI/CD process, 
and that container image should never change until we rebuild it, then why can our container go off to app get other trees and download and update and install a new package? That should never happen unless if the developer going rogue and trying to do something outside of the normal boundaries, which happens, but more likely, it's a malicious hacker who's broken in for the application, wanting to go off and install a compiler or some other packages so that they can launch a DDoS attack from your system, which is not what we want and definitely not what we need in our lives. And so with the egress gateway, by managing all of our outbound traffic, we can block everything and then we can whitelist the APIs and the endpoints that we actually care about. So if we need to go off to Azure or the DigitalOcean API, we can whitelist that. We can make that available, but it can't go off and talk to the entire internet or accidentally upload our database to some rogue um, website in somewhere. And so extremely powerful and more importantly, an accessible way to define and control how that works, because fundamentally all we're doing is configuring and deploying our Kubernetes objects. Um, and so with that, in mind. Let's do a quick summary. So the key takeaway points here, what I wanted to get across is a service mesh removes the need for applications to be concerned about certain layers of the infrastructure. Things like retries, things like security logic, all of that can be pushed down and let an actual dedicated platform take care of it and let us focus on building on top of it. And then as a result, building something more secure, something more reliable. We've seen from all of the metrics that it's collecting, it gives us great visibility. We had all of these great dashboards and tracing just because we had Istio there managing and controlling our traffic. And so we got all of this available. But on the flip side, it is an extra layer. It is an extra level of complexity, and that's why you need to decide whether this is right for you. I think eventually, service messages will be available everywhere. All the cloud providers will have a checkbox saying, like, deploy Istio and it will just become the de facto standard. At the moment, that's still too early to sell, but with the release last week, they are now claiming that Istio is enterprise ready, so I think we're gonna see a lot more rapid adoption of this taking place. As I mentioned, all of the content is available on Catacona, so you can play around with Istio, you can deploy it, experiment with some more of the advanced features that um, we discussed, but I didn't have time to show you. Um, and you can try, if you have any questions or would like to know more, please feel free to email me or for those on coming on Saturday, you can speak to me then. Um, and with that, thank you very much. I have catch code stickers for those who are interested. We are hiring, so for those who are interested in a new role, then we are definitely looking for people to come and join and help us. But with that, thank you very much for coming and I hope you found it valuable. Cheers.